as nearly all troops have now left Afghanistan. But now China is looking to ramp up its involvement in the country uh, as a direct line to the rich assets of the Middle East. Afghan officials have reportedly become more engaged with Chinese leaders on a potential infrastructure deal. Joining me right now is former Trump deputy national security advisor and the author of Revolution, KT McFarland, is here. KT, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for being here. When I saw the news that China is looking to partner with Afghanistan, I thought, okay, here we go again with the CCP uh, and its efforts to overtake America as the number one superpower. Your thoughts on what is taking place with regard to Afghanistan, KT? You're absolutely right. I mean, the Chinese always had designs on Afghanistan, but it was always complicated to do stuff there. Well, now America's built an infrastructure in Afghanistan, and the Chinese are just going to come right in. And what they're going to do is two things. One, they're going to go after the uh, rare earth minerals. China uh, needs a lot of these rare earth minerals that Afghanistan has, China doesn't have. And it needs those things, especially in its, its technology industry. So it's going to cut deals with the corrupt uh, warlords in Afghanistan to get access to it. The second thing it's going to do is it's going to cut deals with the corrupt leaders in Afghanistan for their Belt Road initiative. Uh, China wants to build a Eurasian global trading route. They have a land-based route called the Belt Road Initiative, and they're going to do a maritime route uh, through the South China Sea. So Afghanistan is key to that land-based route. So the Chinese are moving in. The Chinese, um, and you said this before, Maria, and you're perfectly suited to understand it because you're a businesswoman, you're an economist deep down before you're an expert on China and other things. You realize that China, it wants to dominate the world, not with military power, not by invading places. They want to do it with, with technology. They want to do it with trade war and economic war. And they plan to do it in international organizations. You saw that with COVID and their takeover of the World Health Organization. You know, this is going to be the real problem. The United States can't stand up alone against China and all these other nations and Russia. We need partners in this. We, if we are going to stand up and protect our technology, protect our democracy, protect our way of life, we need partners. And the, and the natural partners are in Europe. The Germans, however, for example, largest country in continental Europe, most powerful in continental Europe, they want to trade with China. They want to sell cars to China. So they don't really want to join us in any of this. The Brits may be a better and closer ally, even though, as you point out, the Chinese are trying to acquire a British um, ship company. Maybe the prime minister of Great Britain steps in. But I think that our better move in all of this is to look to Asia for allies, is to look to Japan, yep. Korea, and particularly to India. That's the move. Yeah. And, and you know they get it. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has been bullying its neighbors in the South China Sea. And during the 2020 yeah. lockdown across the world, the CCP used it as an opportunity to in invade India and, and fight over the Himalaya mountains and, and kill 20 soldiers in doing so. First off, the deal means China gets to pour billions of dollars into Iran's banking, telecommunications, transportation and infrastructure sectors over the next 25 years, including huge investments in nuclear power, ports and oil and gas industries. The cash infusion coming as the Islamic regime continues to endure the economic strain of U.S. imposed sanctions and looks to China to ease their pain. The investment for Iran means that China is backing it. And that is perhaps the most important benefit for Tehran. It knows that come hell or high water, Beijing will be behind it. In exchange, Iran gives China a steady supply of oil to fuel its expanding economy. China imports more than 300,000 barrels of Iranian oil every day. This deal gives it even more oil at a deep discount. Remember, the U.S. has sanctions on purchases of Iranian oil. And China, for the last year or so, has been buying it openly in violation of those sanctions. This is another indication of sort of an in-your-face maneuver on the part of Beijing. The partnership means the communist government now has a strategic foothold in a region historically dominated by U.S. influence. The Chinese are solidifying economic relationships, not just with the Iranians, but across uh, the Gulf as well. And I think most importantly, they are looking to use the Iranians as a pawn 
uh, in the larger game of strategic competition uh, against the West and particularly against America. The agreement calls for closer military ties and more intelligence sharing. Experts warn the new China-Iran access could mean potentially more money to fund the Islamic regime's proxy forces in Yemen, Syria and Iraq and further destabilize the Middle East. Because it gives Iran backing, um, undermines every other country's diplomacy in the region. This is uh, going to be a problem not only for Washington, but also for Jerusalem. It's going to be a problem for the Sunni Arab states. Shi Wei Wang, a Chinese-American, spent 40 months in an Iranian prison on alleged spy charges, gaining his freedom in a prisoner swap in 2019. He says the China-Iran deal is likely to force the Biden administration to give up more concessions as it seeks to rejoin the 2015 nuclear deal forged by President Obama and scrapped by President Trump. There's talk of a new proposal for Tehran with possible sanctions relief in coming weeks. The Biden administration's eagerness to re-engage uh, Iran is creating a conducive environment for China to entrench uh, its influence and interest in Iran. And then if China can do that, other countries in the Middle East would be compelled uh, to work with China closer. As America pivots to Asia to confront Beijing's rise, it leaves a potential vacuum in the Middle East that has global powers like China and others only too happy to fill. China as well as Russia are looking to capitalize on vacuums that the U.S. may leave, whether it's in the Levant or in the Persian Gulf, and use their military relationships, their economic relationships and their political relationships uh, to offset what they perceive to be declining U.S. power. This is the first time the Israeli Air Force participates in this multilateral maneuver of sophisticated F-35 stealth aircraft, among others, alongside a number of Israeli allies from NATO, including Italy, Britain and the United States. Furthermore, as part of this exercise, the Israeli Air Force participates in simulations of a wide variety of operational scenarios which include defense missions, air-to-air -air combat, aerial strikes, countering surface-to-air SAM missile battery threats, air support to ground forces, and other scenarios over enemy territory. Meanwhile, Israeli Air Force Commander Major General Amikam Nolkin praised the exercise, saying it strengthens Israel's multi-regional strategic cooperation with European nations and with the United States. It is important to know that alongside the Israeli Air Force, the Britain's aircraft carrier battle group, which includes the HMS Queen Elizabeth, also partakes in this exercise ahead of an eight-month voyage that will cross through the South China Sea and what declaratively aims to signal Beijing that maritime shipping must remain uninterrupted. It sends a message of NATO's resolve and our uh, capability and willingness to defend all allies against any threat. And it also uh, sends a message of how NATO allies can operate together. This is a British uh, aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth, uh, with uh, um, a fifth generation aircraft from the United States with US Marines and the Dutch frigate helping to protect it. Uh, so it also demonstrates how we operate together, uh, bring allies together. So we don't regard China as an adversary, um, and there are also opportunities related to the rise of China. At the same time, uh, we know that China will soon have the biggest economy in the world. Uh, they only has uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the second largest defense budget and the biggest navy in the world. Uh, and of course, this matters for NATO. In other news, the U.S.-based Washington Post has reported that Russia is preparing to supply Iran with an advanced satellite system that will allow the Islamic Republic to monitor IDF bases and activity, as well as other military targets in the Middle East and beyond. Per the report citing U.S. officials, the plan would deliver to the Iranians a Russian-made Canopus 5 satellite, equipped with a high-resolution camera that would greatly enhance Iran's spying capabilities allowing continuous monitoring of facilities ranging from Persian Gulf oil refineries and Israeli military bases to Iraqi barracks that house U.S. troops. TV7 could not immediately independently corroborate this report, and the respective Israeli and Russian defense ministries were not immediately available for comment. 
More than 1,100 rockets and counting have been indiscriminately fired from the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip toward Israel's southern and central civilian communities. While in tandem, the Israeli military is in the process of conducting hundreds of aerial strikes against militant targets across the Hamas-controlled enclave. Separately, wide-scale riots have erupted in Arab towns and cities across Israel, as well as in mixed communities where both Muslims and Jews live side by side. Following much of the day yesterday, during which hostilities were primarily concentrated to rocket fire on southern Israeli communities and Israeli airstrikes on militant installations in the northern Gaza Strip, the Islamist Hamas organization set an ultimatum, which demanded an end to Israeli bombardments by 9 p.m. yesterday evening, or else it vowed to direct its rocket fire toward the densely populated city of Tel Aviv. After Israel ignored the ultimatum, the Islamist organizations in the Hamas-controlled enclave launched hundreds of rockets towards central Israel, a number of which managed to penetrate the country's aerial defense array, scoring direct strikes on residential structures and a bus, claiming the lives of three Israelis and injuring dozens of others, effectively raising the total number of casualties to at least five Israelis and one Indian caregiver. Consequently, the Israeli Air Force received the green light to broaden the scale of operations in the Hamas-controlled territory by targeting high-profile targets of militant leaders and structures, including the Islamist organization's intelligence headquarters, which is situated in a high-rise residential building. Subsequently, amid hundreds of militant targets being destroyed throughout the Palestinian enclave, Alongside targeted assassinations of a growing number of senior Hamas commanders, the leader of the Islamist organization, Ismail Haniya, published a film statement from his undisclosed bunker, in which he stressed, in light of persisting efforts by Egypt, Qatar, and the United Nations to reach a ceasefire, his organization's willingness to de-escalate the situation. <laughs> أمس وحتى الآن تجري مع الأشقاء في مصر وكذلك إخوتنا في قطر ومع الأمم المتحدة ونحن قلنا للجميع بأن الذي أشعل النار تحديدا في القدس والأقصى وامتد لهيبها إلى غزة هو الاحتلال الإسرائيلي وبالتالي هو المسؤول عن كل التداعيات إذا بدهم يصعدوا المقاومة جاهزة بدهم يوقفوا المقاومة جاهزة بدهم يرفعوا يدهم عن القدس المقاومة جاهزة هذه رسالة أوصلناها لجميع الأطراف ولكل من يعنيه الأمر well, speaking about his will to potentially reach a ceasefire, Hamas militants continue to employ a new tactic in which massive barrages of rockets are concentrated toward a single Israeli town or city in an evident effort to overwhelm Israel's aerial defense array. Therefore, the IDF Home Front Command Chief Major General Oli Goldin, during a tour of residential buildings struck by hostile projectiles, urged Israel's residents to remain attentive to the military's instructions. It is crucial to highlight that Jerusalem is seemingly intent on significantly weakening the capabilities of the Islamist organizations in the Gaza Strip. During a press conference that was delivered at the Defense Ministry in Tel Aviv, Israeli Prime Minister Bimi Netanyahu emphasized that the military operation in the Gaza Strip will continue. <laughs> חמאס והג'אדי האסלאמי שילמו, ואני אומר לכם כאן, ישלמו מחיר כבד מאוד על התוקפנות שלהם. אני אומר כאן הערב, דמם בראשם. 
Defense Minister Benny Gantz, who served as the IDF Chief of General Staff during the previous 2014 war against the terror organizations in Gaza for his part, highlighted the significant damage being done to Hamas and its allies, which have evidently miscalculated the scope with which Israel penetrated its ranks. Sal poel ba 24 shot ahronot beyachad ima shabak betzida shel hamishtara ועושה זאת באופן עוצמתי ובמאות תקיפות. מפעלי ייצור, מנהרות, מגדלים שמשמשים את ראשי הארגונים מתפוררים ברחבי עזה וימשיכו להתפורר. יש המון מטרות בקנה, זו רק ההתחלה. אני מכיר את הזירה העזתית. ארגוני הטרור נפגעו קשות וימשיכו להיפגע בגלל ההחלטה המופקרת שלהם לראות לשטח מדינת ישראל. אנחנו נחזיר את השקט והביטחון ונעשה זאת לטווח רחוק. גנץ also sees the opportunity to address the international community, emphasizing Israel's natural right to defend its population and territory. אני מבקש לומר גם למנהיגי מדינות העולם אין מדינה ריבונית שהייתה מקבלת ירי על ריכוזי אוכלוסייה, אין מדינה ריבונית שהייתה מסכימה שיפגעו בה, וגם אנחנו לא מקבלים זאת. יש לנו את הזכות והחובה לפעול, וכך נעשה. As a four mentioned, amid the worsening conflict between Israel and the Islamist organizations in the Gaza Strip, Violent riots erupted in a number of towns and cities across Israel, which are either predominantly Arab or classified as mixed with relatively equal numbers of Jews and Arabs living side by side. During these riots, which included thousands of Israeli Arabs damaging property of their Israeli Jewish neighbors, including the burning of dozens of vehicles, synagogues and police posts. I can confirm to TV7 that the Israeli National Police are continuing to be mobilized in the different areas across the country after wide-scale riots that took place from the north in Akko towards the central area Lod, Ramleh, as well as down south. Our units will respond to all levels of violence in order to prevent vehicles from being burnt, synagogues from being burnt, and our security measures will continue over the next 48 hours towards the end of Ramadan. It is important to explain that the riots throughout the country were apparently instigated when an Arab-Israeli resident of the city of Lod was gunned down by an Israeli-Jewish resident when a group of Muslim rioters, as part of clashes related to detentions over Jerusalem, attacked Jewish residents of the city a day prior. Meanwhile, the international community is evidently divided over the situation in Israel and the Gaza Strip. In a phone conversation, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan told his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin that the international community should give Israel a strong and deterrent lesson and even suggested to the Russian leader that a so-called international protection force to shield the Palestinians should be considered. Separately, Israel's immediate neighbors, Jordan and Egypt, in an emergency Arab League foreign ministerial, voiced outrage over what they perceived as oppressive Israeli practices. However, it has been noted that their focus was primarily on the events taking place in Jerusalem rather than the ongoing conflict in Gaza or elsewhere. Israel is playing with the fire. The fire and 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 the fire وتهدد أمن المنطقة واستقرارها وسيكون لاستمرارها في عدوانياتها وعن جهيتها انعكاسات على كل شيء بما في ذلك على العلاقات الأردنية الإسرائيلية إن مصر تعلن رفضها التام واستنكارها لتلك الممارسات الإسرائيلية الغاشمة وتعتبرها انتهاكا للقانون الدولي وتقويدا لفرص التوصل إلى حل الدولتين وتهديدا جسيما لركائز الامن والاستقرار في المنطقه. ان انتهاك حرمه المسجد الاقصى في هذه الايام المباركه وبهذه الطريقه يعد استفزازا لمشاعر المؤمنين في كل العالم الاسلامي. Separately, the European Union's 27 member states have voiced outrage over the ongoing Palestinian rocket fire, which is deliberately directed at Israeli civilians. 
and called for immediate de-escalation. The U.S. State Department, for its part, joined the call for de-escalation and restraint. It also emphasized Israel's right to self-defense. Turkey and Russia discuss sending troops to Israel to protect the Palestinians. Is this an escalation of war? Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Russia's Vladimir Putin this week discussed the international community and their need to send troops to Israel to protect the Palestinians and, quote, teach a deterrent lesson to Israel. Hamas also unveiled drones it plans to use against civilians in Israel. The IDF has released video of a drone flying and then being shot down. These drones appear to be based on the Iranian Ababil drones. They are more dangerous than rockets because they can carry warheads and also be slowly and carefully manipulated and maneuvered to hit specific targets. Now, Iran has long boasted that it has drones with ranges of like hundreds of miles. And Iran has said it has increased the armaments it can put on these drones. That means Iran has a drone army that combines the kind of smart munition elements that cruise missiles have. The drones can be operated in swarms too. And now it appears they are sharing these with Hamas to terrorize Israel. It is a frightening situation. And if that's not enough, as of this morning, Israeli troops are now gathering on the border of Gaza to possibly enter that region with ground forces. It is into this exacerbation of events that Putin and Erdogan had their phone call, ignored by most of the mainstream media, but shocking in its potential impact if what they talked about comes about. So first of all, why would Erdogan and Putin get involved? For the same reason as Hamas, they want the Palestinians to believe they are their ultimate protector and thus increase their own political power in the region. Erdogan also said the nation should consider the idea of sending international protection forces to the region in order to protect Palestinian civilians. UN Security Council could get involved, he said, give clear messages to Israel to halt attacks before the crisis grows further. Calling Israel the cruelest terrorist state in the world, Erdogan also told Putin the international community needs to, quote, teach a deterrent lesson, unquote, to Israel, adding that Turkey was working to mobilize this reaction. Now, what kind of deterrent does he have in mind? Economic? Political? Military? He wasn't clear, but Christians should keep an eye on this. Hamas also made statements to Saudi Arabia and other Gulf Coast Arab states who have joined the Abraham Accord to denounce Israel for defending itself. But so far, the Gulf states are silent on this front. So right now, it is Turkey, Russia, and Iran taking sides with the Palestinians and the Gulf Arabs kind of sitting this one out. And where is the new administration in the USA? which, as you know, is not particularly pro-Israel. It appears all these escalations are taking place completely unchecked. And the U.S. is just sitting this one out as well. So what should Christians do about these sudden escalations? Well, for one, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as we are instructed, that ultimate peace being the return of Jesus, after all. A conflict in West Asia is the true test for any world power. We know that. Whether it's Iran or the war for oil or the question of Israel and Palestine, many world powers have been humbled by the power plays in West Asia. But they keep coming back to try again. And this time there's a new player on the block. A rising power eager to display its diplomatic chops. It is China. The last war of Gaza was in 2014. Back then, Xi Jinping was just settling into office. He had taken charge in 2013. But this time around, in 2021, he's a lot more assertive, both over his party and his country. So President Xi Jinping thinks that he is ready for the West Asian test. And what better place to start than Israel and Palestine?
China's first move was an offer to mediate. Beijing wants negotiators from Israel and Palestine to fly out to China. It really is a bizarre offer because China has virtually no stake in this conflict. The two-state solution, we can tell you, is older than the People's Republic itself. So it's difficult to imagine Chinese negotiators having any impact. Plus, this negotiation needs subtle diplomacy, which is not exactly China's strength. The second move was to offer a four-point solution. And this was pushed by Foreign Minister Wang Yi of China at the United Nations Security Council. What are they proposing? Here are the four points. Number one, an immediate ceasefire. Number two, lifting the blockade on Gaza and offering humanitarian assistance. Number three, a more vigorous role for the Security Council. And number four, pushing on with the two-state solution. Now, this might sound promising, but China is literally the last country to propose this. They're retracing the steps already taken by the likes of the U.S. and Russia. So why is China even bothering to get involved in something like this? Because there is a conflict unfolding in West Asia. And for countries like China, conflicts are opportunities to rebuild their image, to display their leadership, and to extend their influence. Let's talk about the first one, rebuilding their image. China does not like the headlines on Xinjiang. It hates being called Islamophobic. So that's exactly how it's behaving. That's exactly what they're doing to the Uyghur Muslims in China. So supporting Palestine is perhaps a shot at redemption because the next time someone accuses China of Islamophobia, it can always turn around and say, what about Palestine? Their second objective is to display leadership and this involves pitting themselves against the US. Now Joe Biden, we know, is still figuring out his West Asia policy. Right now it involves a lot of phone calls and nothing else, and he's not getting anywhere. At the Security Council, Biden is blocking a statement on Israel, and this is exactly what China has been waiting for. A conflict spiraling out of control, and America missing in action. So what does China do? Go into a diplomatic overdrive, and they have offered to mediate and listed a four-point solution. All of this indicates China's global ambitions. But for a global power, a footprint in West Asia is a must, which brings us to the third objective, extending influence. Israel and Palestine are key gateways of the Belt and Road Initiative. And China is slowly sinking its nails into Israel. It is funding big projects, some of them with strategic implications, like the container port in Haifa, it is the third largest city in Israel. From this port, China can keep an eye on the U.S. 6th Fleet. They're also building a second port in the city of Ashdod and a light rail project in Tel Aviv. This will run a few hundred meters from Israel's military headquarters. Now, these are not loans. So Israel does not have to worry about the dreaded, dreaded debt trap. But they do give China a strategic foothold in Israel. By 2018, Chinese companies were investing $400 million in Israeli startups. 53% of this investment was by state-run companies. Same story with bilateral trade. China is Israel's second largest trading partner. Did you know that? And Israel is China's second largest arms provider. Their total trade is worth around $11 billion. This is an expanding relationship. And peace is key to keeping this relationship steady which is why China is pushing hard for a ceasefire. Beijing has millions of dollars tied up in West Asia. For them, the two-state solution is a business agenda. It has nothing to do with peace. What's worrying is that both Israel and Palestine seem oblivious to what is happening here. They're making the same mistake as the rest of the world, underestimating China's threat. America, India, Europe, they've all made this mistake. And decades later, the world is paying the price for it. Meanwhile, Turkey is calling on Muslim nations to mobilize against Israel in the ongoing conflict with Palestine. Turkey's vice president wants the Islamic world to send a united and clear message to Israel. Ankara also criticized world powers for not doing enough to stop the violence. President Erdogan is a prominent critic of Israel. He described the country as a terrorist state. After the storming of the Al-Aqsa Mosque on Monday, Erdogan has repeatedly slammed Israeli occupation of the West Bank and its treatment of the Palestinians. 
Erdogan's deputy says that Muslim countries that do not display unity are effectively party to the conflict. On Wednesday, Erdogan discussed the Israel-Palestine conflict with Russian President Vladimir Putin. He urged the international community to teach a deterrent lesson to Israel and Turkey is also proposing to send peacekeepers to safeguard Palestinians. A similar proposal was made back in 2018 as well. Russia and China are spearheading the emergence of an Asian power bloc. This loose alliance of Asian nations has enormous global influence and is redefining the world order. Russia is expanding its presence in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. China, too, is making rapid advancements, chiefly island building in disputed territory in the South China Sea putting a stranglehold on critical trade routes in the region. The emergence of this Asian alliance is actually mentioned in Bible prophecy. A prophecy in Revelation chapter 16 refers to this end-time Asian bloc as the kings of the east. Ezekiel chapter 38 prophesies specifically that this alliance is led by a strong man in Russia. A prophecy in Isaiah chapter 23 says that the kings of the east will form a trade alliance with an end-time German-led European superpower. But this cooperation will be short-lived. Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 through 45 says that once the king of the north destroys the king of the south, it will be troubled by tidings out of the east. Revelation chapter 9 shows that altogether the kings of the east will amass an army of 200 million. This massive army will battle with the German-led European superpower and also with Jesus Christ at his second coming. Following this battle, Jesus Christ will usher in a new era of peace and prosperity for the whole earth.